Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the AI Hardware Show. I'm Sally Ward-Foxton with EE Times. This is Ian Cutress with More Than More. Today, we're going to be talking about data center training chips. Ian's favorite. Ooh, high power stuff. <laughs> Big stuff. Bigger bar better. <laughs> it's going to be great. NVIDIA's Blackwell is more than just a chip, it's a whole family. It starts with the B200 GPU built on TSMC's 4N node, featuring two GPU dies per package, advanced packaging, and a staggering 208 billion transistors. It packs 192 gigabytes of HBM3E and delivers class-leading performance tailored for current generation models. It also costs an arm and a leg if you want one in person. The demand for NVIDIA is so high right now, some parts of the supply chain are sold out for the next two years. As an AI chip, Blackwell is often paired with NVIDIA's own Grace CPU. The 72-core ARM chip with Blackwell is a combo called GB200, a super chip configuration with a total of 896 gigabytes of shared memory and a custom high-speed chip-to-chip interconnect. At the rack level, NVIDIA offers NVL72 clusters, 72 GPUs and 36 CPUs, all linked together by NVLink for some insane compute performance. 720 petaflops of dense FP4, 360 petaflops of dense FP8. A full rack requires 120 kilowatts of power, redefining how future data centers are built. NVIDIA also offers the B300 and GB300 using HPM3E memory for more capacity and higher speed. While the B200 rack versions have been shipping since the beginning of 2025, the B300 racks should be coming out in the second half of this year. The roadmap doesn't stop there. Next generation Vera Rubin chips are due in the second half of 2026, pairing a new ARM-based Vera CPU with a new Rubin GPU based on TSMC's 3 nanometer process using HBM4. That's followed by Rubin Ultra in 2027 and capped with the next-gen Feynman architecture by 2028. NVIDIA CEO Jensen Huang has been very clear. They're pushing an annual cadence now. This means new GPUs, new CPUs, deeper interconnects, bigger racks, and more power. All the big companies are buying them and building data centers to put them in. As this is being filmed, NVIDIA just hit a $4 trillion evaluation on the stock market. Everyone, it seems, is betting big, really big. It's the more you buy, the more you save, right? That is exactly it. Jensen's law of AI. <laughs> now, AMD's MI350 series is the company's most aggressive move against NVIDIA in the AI accelerator market yet. Based on the cDNA4 architecture and fabrication on TSMC's N3P node, the MI350X and 355X deliver a clean generational jump over the MI300 series. Each GPU integrates 185 billion transistors across chiplets using hybrid bonding, as well as 288 gigabytes of HPM3 and 8 terabytes per second of bandwidth. This is the highest capacity AI GPU memory shipping today. Compute throughput scales from 5 petaflops FP16 to over 20 petaflops for FP6 or FP4, targeting transformer inference at scale. Matrix throughput per compute unit has doubled since the previous series, but AMD claims a 4 times generation on generation increase in raw AI compute and a 35x leap in inference throughput. The MI355X reaches a 1.4 kilowatt power for a liquid cool deployment, while the 350X stays within a kilowatt for air cooled systems. Now, critically, AMD kept the MI350 pin compatible with AMI 300 platforms, so customers like Microsoft Meta, Oracle, and OpenAI can drop in the new chips without re-architecting racks. That, paired with a 30% list price advantage versus NVIDIA, according to analysts, puts pressure on both CapEx and the integration cost. But hardware alone isn't enough. NVIDIA's CUDA ecosystem still holds the high ground, and millions of developers and years of tooling maturity. AMD is betting big on Rockham 7 and its own developer cloud to close the gap, and it's already shipping with PyTorch, TensorFlow, and JAX support. AMD has also teased the next generation of its roadmap, MI400, as well as rack scale systems using technologies such as Ultra Accelerator Link and Ultra Ethernet. Ironwood is Google's seventh generation TPU, designed to train and serve the largest AI models in production today. It builds on a decade of vertical silicon investment, pushing scale, memory, and bandwidth to new limits. While inference efficiency has improved, Ironwood remains a full training class chip, powering everything from Gemini to recommender systems. The chip uses an evolved systolic array at its core, pairing matrix multiply units with vector and scalar engines. Each chip integrates 192 gigabytes of HBM, delivering 7.37 terabytes per second of memory bandwidth, more than four times that of the previous generation. 
Google's in-house interchip interconnect has been scaled to 1.2 terabytes per second bi-directional per chip, supporting tightly coupled mesh configurations across thousands of devices. Each Ironwood chip peaks at 4.6 petawatts of FP8 compute. In its largest deployment, which is 9,216 chips per pod, Google claims over 42.5 exaflops, consuming just under 10 megawatts. EE Times notes this is more than 24 times the compute of El Capitan, the leading supercomputer by raw FP8 throughput. Power efficiency is up to 2x gen on gen, and nearly 30 times versus Google's 2018 chip designs. Sparse core has been enhanced to handle massive embeddings for recommender systems, but Ironwood is not a chip that's for sale, it's only available via Google Cloud. This vertical integration lets Google tightly align silicon, software, and infrastructure, offering performance and cost advantages other clouds can't easily replicate. Out of all the hyperscaler chips, it's Google's TPU stack, like Ironwood, that's truly rivaling competitors like AMD in terms of volume. There are several reports online showcasing this, so we do wonder if other hyperscalers can build to match. Huawei's Ascend 910C is the company's most ambitious AI processor to date, built at a company called SMIC in China that has a supposed 7 nanometer class node, the 910C is designed to anchor China's sovereign AI compute strategy. It is the successor to the CSMC fabricated Ascend 910, but unlike its predecessor, it's entirely manufactured under US sanctions. The 910C uses Huawei's in-house DaVinci architecture, something we first saw on the smartphones before the sanctions, and is positioned to challenge Nvidia's GPUs within China's borders. Each 910C silicon die is actually a 910B and contains around 53 billion transistors and supports HBM2E memory. Performance claims suggest 320 teraflops of FP16 and 64 teraflops of Intate, though these figures remain unaudited. Based on presentations, Huawei's Cloud Matrix 384 system integrates 384 of these chips and reaches around 300 petaflops of BrainFlow 16. For those keeping track, this doubles the peak throughput of NVIDIA's Rackscale MVL72 on paper, but at nearly four times the power. A full Cloud Matrix 384 burns 559 kilowatts compared to NVIDIA's 120 to 145. Huawei scale first strategy reflects process constraints. Yield estimates at ESMIC remain low, reportedly around 20%, forcing Huawei to compensate with volume rather than per chip efficiency. The optical mesh used in Cloud Matrix 384 was presented at Hot Chips earlier in 25 and claimed seven 400 gig optical transceivers per chip and a 2.8 terabits per second vertical interconnect. Now Ascend 910C forms the compute base for Huawei's CAN software stack and MindSpore AI framework. These remain largely domestic tools targeting Chinese customers like telecom firms and ByteDance and especially those cut off from Nvidia hardware. So while Huawei markets older chips in the Middle East and Southeast Asia, the 910C exports remain tightly restricted. Huawei's long-term roadmap includes uh, chips like the 910D and Ascend 920, but geopolitical pressure continues to shape both its manufacturing options and market reach. Performance gaps persist, but in aggregate, Huawei is building the volume to stay in the race. This is actually supported by Jensen Huang's statement, you know, that CEO of NVIDIA, who has said multiple times that if China can't buy NVIDIA, they'll just build something multiple times the size, regardless of efficiency. Tranium 2 is Amazon's second generation AI accelerator, purpose-built for training and inference at hyperscale. It delivers up to four times the performance of its predecessor while improving energy efficiency by a factor of three. Amazon states that these chips are targeting generative models with a wide range of model sizes, from billions to over a trillion parameters. Each chip integrates two compute dies and four stacks of HBM3E, offering 96 gigabytes of total memory and a memory bandwidth of 2.9 terabytes per second. The two in-package chips are connected via Neuron Link, Amazon's custom die to die interconnect at one terabyte per second. Scale-out networking comes through Amazon's own elastic fabric architecture, the V3, at up to 12.8 terabits per second per server. For performance, Amazon quotes its dense eight-bit floating point performance uh, 1.3 petaflops peak per chip, or 83 petaflops across the 64 chip ultra server. Sparse 8-bit floating point, depending on the sparsity, will double or quadruple that number. These numbers align with AWS's shift towards model sparsity, stochastic rounding, and microscaling, all supported in hardware. Now, Tranium 2 is deployed exclusively in AWS Cloud. It's not sold as a component. Customers access the hardware through TRN2 instances or ultra servers, uh, which powers workloads for companies like Anthropic, Databricks, ByteDance, and internal tools like Amazon's Rufus Assistant. 
The chip is supported by the Neuron SDK, offering native JAX, PyTorch, and hugging face supports with a low-level neuron kernel interface for researchers. Tranium 2 was co-developed with Annapurna Labs and manufactured using advanced silicon processes. Amazon hasn't disclosed the node, but industry analysts suggest a maturity SMC process and advanced packaging are involved. AWS's goal here is operational simplicity, both for itself and its customers. E-Times has noted that Amazon says its objective is to make migration boring and that Tranium as a concept should be a frictionless alternative to GPU-centric stacks. This means that for AWS, the silicon is strategic. Tranium 2 isn't just faster, but cheaper to operate, easier to scale, and entirely theirs to control. So here's an interesting one for you. Big Island, the code name for the iLoveAtar Core-X Tianjian 100, and has been described online as China's first domestically produced 7 nanometer GPGPU. Now that's a hell of a company name, iLoveAtar Core-X. And to be honest, I hadn't heard of this until we started researching for the new season. What makes it interesting is that this chip is used primarily for AI training. Built in 2021, the chip represents a key milestone in China's effort to reduce reliance on foreign compute hardware. Perhaps surprisingly, as noted online, the company achieved a one-pass tape-out for the silicon, an outcome typically rare even for seasoned global chipmakers. At launch, the Big Island chip was reportedly competitive with NVIDIA Ampere and AMD cDNA3, two of the top competing AI training architectures at the time. Company sources claim the chip features around 53 billion transistors and delivers strong 16-bit floating-point performance at a lower cost than foreign alternatives. Alavatar also emphasizes flexibility and programmability and its proximity to domestic cloud customers as key differentiators. This chip has seen deployment across China's server and cloud stack, often paired with Phytium CPUs or Hygon CPUs. According to the company's disclosures, the Tianjin 100 has secured orders totaling approximately 200 million Chinese yuan, or about $30 million, from more than 200 customers. While commercial traction matters, Alavatar's role is also strategic. The company is backed by government-affiliated investors and partnered with institutions like the Shanghai Supercomputer Center, aligning with China's national push for semiconductor self-sufficiency. But challenges still remain. In 2022, the CEO, who was formerly of the Xinhua Group, Unigroup, was reportedly detained in a government investigation. The event was widely reported and signals the risks tied to state-linked firms operating under intense political scrutiny. Nonetheless, Alavatar is still pressing ahead, with designs underway for a second and third generation training chip and a growing software platform. We'll be honest, we thought Buren as a company was already on the heap of dead AI companies. But after the US sanctions hit them in late 2022, TSMC was forced to halt production. They were then added to the entity list a few months later, crushing their hopes and dreams. Their flagship chip, the BR100, had vanished from the, eco the ecosystem, and for a while it looked like that was it. But it turns out Buren isn't quite dead, they're just adapting. Now we covered Buren technology in the previous season. They started strong, founded in 2019 by ex-NVIDIA and Alibaba engineers. They were one of China's most ambitious GPU startups. The BR100 chip was their big swing, a dual die design built on TSMC 7 nanometer node with 77 billion transistors and a 550 watt TDP. It packed 64 gigabytes of HPM2E and reportedly delivered 256 teraflops of 32-bit floating point, positioning it squarely against NVIDIA's A100. They built a CUDA-like stack called Buren Super and claimed 2.6 times faster performance than NVIDIA on vision and language workloads. Buren locked in partnerships with China Mobile, ZTE, and Shanghai AI Lab. By 2022, Buren had raised nearly a billion dollars and hit $2.7 billion valuation. For a moment, it looked like China finally had a data center class GPU challenger. Then came the sanctions. In October 2022, the US imposed export controls on high performance chips. TSMC had to stop building Buren's silicon. Buren reportedly tried to tweak the BR100 into the BR104, disabling functionality to stay under the US performance thresholds, but it didn't work. In 2023, the US added Buren to its entity list, cutting off access to advanced fabs entirely. And yet, they're still moving. Buren has reportedly secured another $280 million from local and government-linked investors. They're now preparing for a Hong Kong IPO after backing away from a mainland listing. According to sources, uh, Buren remains part of the sanctioned but funded cohort, caught between geopolitical fire and domestic urgency. They're also facing stiff competition from other Chinese competitors, Huawei, Cambricon, and Mflame. They've also had some leadership turnover. But the point is, Buren isn't a cautionary tale, at least not yet. They're still in the race. They just don't get to use TSMC. We just don't know who or with what the next chip is going to come.
Well, not yet, anyway. It's interesting to see how many companies now are solely going after training versus realizing that in the future inference. I mean, we've got what, four or five episodes this season just purely on inference chips? So inference is definitely where the market is right now and I think most people are seeing that. I think most people are thinking NVIDIA's kind of got the training thing locked up outside of China. NVIDIA's yeah. got training locked up so it's time to not pivot but let's focus more on inference. Let's it's it's say, just easier to make be. an inference chip, isn't it? It is, but if you already have an architecture that's kitted out for training, is yeah. it a good idea to pivot to inference and maybe that's something we should cover in the podcast. Yeah, for sure. Well, thank you, Sally. Thank uh, good you. to see you all, and we'll see you on the next episode.